I want you to take your Bible tonight, if you would. And uh, we kind of left off last Wednesday night with a little bit of an assignment. And can anybody remember what in the world were we talking about? Anybody besides Melissa remember what in the world we was talking about? Of course, you look on the screen, see it's right up there. Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Salem is not a cigarette, amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know why them wicked people decided to call that thing Salem. But anyway, uh, let's do what? Yeah, that's where the witches are, amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 7, and uh, this is in relation to Christ the chief. Is what I've called this, Christ the chief. He's the head of every office. He's the boss down every hallway. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, the high priest of all the high priests. He's the prophet above all the prophets, the bishop over all the bishops, the head apostle over all the apostles. He's the head of everything. There's nothing higher than him. Everything is below him. Everything is beneath his feet. When you start thinking about eternity and infinity and how high the highest number is. Jeremy, what's the highest number? That's what I thought. You just look like somebody that doesn't have any idea. So I'm going to ask Todd back there, what's the highest number? Where's our college people? Anybody gone to college? Put your hand down. You ain't going to live that long. I can tell you that right now. What'd you say? Infinite? Numbers don't end. But there is a God sitting at the very top of all the highest numbers because he is the most high. You got to think about that for a minute. God's going to just, when we try to comprehend God, it'll just, you'll fry out. Okay? Because we say that the numbers just keep on going and they never stop. We'll never find the end number, the highest number. And yet God's the most high, which indicates that he's at the end of all the numbers. That just, that just blows my mind out. Anyway, that does not compute. I get a big error across my screen when I think about that. So anyway, that's Christ and that's who he is. And so we came upon this question last week of who is Melchizedek? Okay, who is Melk and why does it matter? Well, I kind of think it does. It's just part of this thing where we're going to get some knowledge in us. And then maybe next week or next year or next decade, God will give you some understanding based on that. And then God will give you some wisdom on it. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem. Well, what is, where is Salem, by the way? It is Yerushalem. Jerusalem, Salem. And what does Salem mean? The Hebrew word shalom. Okay? Now the, the Arabic, the, uh, the Arabs, their language is like a first cousin to Hebrew. There are some similarities there. Sort of like the, the Latin-based languages, like French and Spanish and Portuguese and... Um, A little bit of English and things like that. But anyway, there's a commonality there. The Italian, you kind of see it all there. And so Arabic, their word for peace is salam. Okay? And that's like shalom. So there's a, there's a kindred there. But anyway, it's, it's Salem. It's peace. It's Jerusalem, the city of peace. King of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met, by the way, a brother, uh, uh, Jason Cooley. Sent me this the other day. He's way behind on studying numbers. But he said, did you know the phrase most highs in the King James Bible 49 times? And I said, yeah, I wrote a book on it. That's seven times seven. That's perfection. And he said, and he got me on this one. He said, did you know that the first occurrence of most high and the last occurrence of most high, both of them speak of Melchizedek? And I went, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> but I didn't really. But I thought it was pretty cool anyway. Anyway, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, 
and after that also king of Salem. Now, what he's doing, there is, there is a little Hebrew in here. The uh, Hebrew word for king or a chief or somebody that's the top of something is malak, okay, like Moloch. Or Malak is one of the words they use for one of the high angels. That's where you get the Melchizedek part, okay? Melchizedek, king of Salem. So that's the king or the chief part of that phrase. But then you have Melchizedek, king of Salem. He is king of peace, king of righteousness, king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent. In other words, when you go back to Genesis 14 is where this is mentioned, a lot of times in the Old Testament, you'll have somebody named, it'll tell you who their daddy was and who their great daddy, you know, granddaddy was and who their son was. But here, he has no father. It's not mentioned that he has a mother without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, the big deal here in Hebrews 7, and what, what the writer of Hebrews is really trying to get at is, is trying to let you know that when it comes to Levi, we know who Levi's father was, we know who Levi's mother was, we know who Levi's sons were, we know that Levi was born at such and such a time, and we know that Levi died at such and such a time, and Levi is no more. We also know that the Levitical priesthood had a beginning in the days of Moses, they also have had an end because when you destroy the tabernacle and the temple twice and there is no temple anymore, the Levites don't have anything to do but just stand around and say, I'm a Levite. They don't have any priesthood anymore. God did away with that. And God, as far as I'm concerned, not going to bring that back. Now there's people like John Hagee and some of these people, I just don't trust them. Because they say, oh yes, God's going to save Israel in the last days. He's going to restore the Levitical priesthood. and they're going to, God's going to save them through animal sacrifices. And I say, uh, no, sir. Why would you go back to animal blood and have to repeat it every time they do something wrong when you have the eternal blood of Jesus Christ covering sins once and for all? Amen? Why would you do that? And that's the point he's making here. The Levitical priesthood was temporary. It had a beginning, it had an end, and it was always to be that way. God never intended the Levitical priesthood to be a continuing priesthood. But here, that's what he's saying here. Here Melchizedek, made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. That means he's still a priest. Still doing it. Turn just very quickly to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. That's where we're going to find this. By the way, you turn there, and I'm going to throw something in here. Genesis 14 is where Hebrews 7 is pointing you towards. Pointing you toward Hebrews, or excuse me, Genesis 14. Did you know that in Genesis 14, Abraham did not exist? He was Abram. Now, I don't know what to make of this, but I don't think there's a mistake in my Bible. Here, the writer of Hebrews, I think it's Paul, is calling the man who paid tithes to Melchizedek, he's calling him Abraham. But as of Genesis 14, he's not Abraham, he's Abram. He's not Abraham until Genesis 6, 17. Now, I just thought about that, and maybe there's a lot more to it. In fact, I'm sure there is. But say, what are you getting at? Well, I know that at one time in my life, I was a lost, hell-deserving sinner. And I know that at a certain time, God erased all of my sins, God saved me, God transformed me, God, God moved in me, and God did great things in my life for me, and so on and so on. But I also know that God knew that before I ever got saved. God knew that before I was born. God knew that before my mother was born. God knew that before my grandmother was born. In fact, God knew that before he created Adam. So God calls me a son of God even before the foundation of the world, just like Paul 
calling Abram, Abraham, before he's actually Abraham, but he's already Abraham. Make sense? It's because it's not a mystery. God did not wake up one day and say, you know what, I think I'll save Abraham call, and Abram and give him a new name. That's not how God works. God just knows everything. Amen? There may be something more to it, but I just, I just kind of stuck out to me tonight. Anyway, so Genesis 14 uh, is an interesting story. You got a battle of giants here. I believe they're giants, okay? And you might have different interpretation, but I believe, they're in, I believe these kings that are fighting one another are giant kings, all right? But anyway, in verse, uh, in verse uh, let's see here, verse uh, 17... The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kidder Laomer, uh, of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Now, look here. This was before Passover. Before Passover. What were the two parts to Passover? There was the wine, there was the bread. What are the two parts to our communion service? The fruit of the vine, the wine, and the bread. And looky here, he's already bringing forth bread and wine as if like Passover or communion, even before these things have been instituted. The bread, what does the bread symbolize? Christ's body. The, he is uh, the phrase... Uh, uh, what am I thinking of here? Bethlehem, what does that mean? House of bread. Okay, and it's where Jesus comes from. And Jesus said, I'm the bread which comes down from heaven. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he brings forth wine. What does the wine represent? His blood. It's my blood of the new cup. Look at here. He's all, this is before Moses. This wine does not represent the blood of an earthly lamb temporarily put upon a doorpost so that at this one night these people don't, are not slaughtered. This wine represents the eternal blood of Jesus Christ which always saves and as far as I'm concerned, as far as what I see in the Bible, always did save. You ask me how people were saved before Christ, they were saved by Christ. You ask me how people were saved in the Old Testament? Were they saved by the law? No man can be saved by the law. They were saved by the grace of God. They were saved because they believed what God said, like Abraham, and it was imputed unto them for righteousness. And now Abraham's having his communion service with Melchizedek. Now, here's what I do know. In fact, let me keep reading this and then we'll get into it. So, um, verse, uh, he brings forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Verse 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God. Look at here. Verse 18, verse 19, verse 20. How many times is this Most High God mentioned? Three. Isn't that amazing? God the Father, God the Son... God the Holy Spirit, they're not competing against each other. They're always one together. Blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Look here, law keepers. People that uh, say, well, tithing's under the law, so I don't believe we have to tithe anymore. Well, then why don't you just believe that it's probably just a good thing to do then? Before a law was ever instituted that said that you give 10% of your income, here is Abram voluntarily out of his own willing heart. Melchizedek did not say, hey, you want bread and wine? 10% of all them sheep I see back there. He was not setting a price. There was no commandment. This was done voluntarily by Abram. This was done by Abram before he even had his name changed to Abraham. This was done. Tithing is the right thing to do. Can I get God's people to say amen? amen. You don't hear me. You do not hear me right. preaching and hammering tithing all the time because people are sick of it. But when it comes up, I'm not going to shy away from it. You ought to tithe and you ought to give on top of the tithing because you're not going to out-bless God. Amen? 
You're not go- and you're not going to run out of money. You're, it's just not going to happen. Amen? Just get, I, and again, I don't do this, but when it comes along, I'm going to say, why are you sitting on your blessings? Why are you sitting on your obedience? Why are you sitting on your free will choice to do what even Abram, who did not need a preacher telling him about tithing, why are you sitting on something that Abram did voluntarily and he was blessed by it? Okay? So I think you ought to tithe. Amen? Amen. And the king of Sodom said unto... Well, and we could read on down here, but that's pretty much where it ends right there, this deal about Melchizedek. All right? Now... The Bible tells us back here in Hebrews 7 that he is, number one, he's without father, he's without mother, he's without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now, so there's there's one thing that I absolutely know beyond any shadow of any doubt whatsoever, and this is what the Bible's laying out to us. Melchizedek is a priest of God who is not a human priest man born of a woman and a man on this earth okay and it it took me years to figure this out but i i'm reading it and i I, i'm just studying that and i'm going this has got to be an angel this has to be someone who is not a human being like a levite or some other guy from some other land that we just don't have his birthright or what it went his birth certificate kind of like obama We don't have his birth certificate, so, you know, we don't know who he came from. This is somebody from the heavenly realm. And it's a thought that I I never thought of before until I just kind of thought about that, and it dawned on me, Mike, there are angels in heaven who are priests, and they perform a priestly function. Take your Bible, turn to um, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Let's go there. Isaiah chapter 6. Let's see what the Bible says to us here. In verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. We have a temple in heaven. Okay? If we have a temple, then we have angels attending to that temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There's that three again. Holy, holy, holy. It was Old Testament before it was ever New Testament. It was there in the scriptures that God is three. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Okay? The earth is full of his glory. And look at verse 4. And the post of the uh, door moved at the voice of him that cried. The house was filled with smoke. Verse 5. Then said, I woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the... What? Now we know there's an altar in heaven. In fact, there's, there was two altars in the tabernacle and in the temple. Can somebody tell me what each one of them did? The first altar was the altar of sacrifice. What did they do with that altar of sacrifice? This is real simple. They put sacrifices on there. They brought in lambs and bullocks and things like that, and they burned them on there. Okay? Now... I want you to think. Let's take that up one dimension. Are there angelic creatures that resemble lambs and bullocks and goats? Yes. And they're evil. And they are made to be taken and destroyed and burnt with fire and in the new heavens and the new earth in Isaiah 66 we're told that we are going to see those who are in the lake of fire we're going to see them okay and I'm going to trust God on that one on his reasoning why 
But for me, the only thing I can think of right now is I would be going, I was headed there, straight to it. And I'm not there for all of eternity. Okay? Now you may differ in that. You may have another idea about that. That's fine. But all of these evil devils that are around us, all these angels that are in a third of the angels are going to be cast down to the earth. These angels that are going to be released out of the prison. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be cast into the fire. Okay? By who? By priestly angels. Okay? By priestly angels. Turn to, um, turn to Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Look at verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense. Now we have the second altar in heaven. The first altar was the, the altar of burnt sacrifice. And the, and the angel took a coal off of that altar and tongs and he put it on Isaiah's lips, and he, it purged his lips, okay? We're purged with fire, okay? Fire is a purgative, okay? And so it purged Isaiah's lips, and now, you know, God says he can go and he can preach. So now we have the other altar. The other altar in the tabernacle and in the temple was not an altar of burnt offerings. It was an altar of incense. What was it for? What was its purpose? What did it represent? Prayers of the saints. Okay? Now, nowhere in this Bible does it tell you that if you pray, light incense. doesn't tell you. There's, because there are people who believe that their form of prayer is lighting incense and that smoke going up to whatever God is their prayer. That's not biblical. I believe prayer is you asking God things with your mind, your heart, or your mouth. Amen? Okay? And uh, we, we don't believe what Roman Catholics believe, that you light all this incense, and that's the prayers of the saints going up. Don't fall for that stuff, okay? The incense was offered with the prayers of the saints, okay? So anyway, so um, verse uh, 3 again, having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. There it is right there. Upon the golden altar which was before the throne, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints. By the way, what direction does smoke go? Think about it, isn't it neat? Just little stuff like that fascinates me. I'm easily fascinated. Okay? And so verse 5, the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices. So we have angels that are in heaven at the temple of God that are... The priests of God who act in their, in their particular order, or their particular designed work, a group of angels attending to the altar of, of, of burnt offerings, a group of angels attending to the altar of incense. There are covering angels. We know that there are two cherubs whose wings fold over the ark of God, the throne of God, covering the throne of God in heaven. We know that there are, there are angels that do that. Um, what other angels? We know that there, these, these, there are eight, there are, excuse me, eight, seven angels here that are the musician angels of heaven that are going to sound seven trumpets. We know later on in the book of Revelation, there's angels that have seven vials of God's wrath. They're going to pour out God's wrath. So there is, a, there is an order of angels in heaven that are the priestly angels. They give attendance to the temple of God in heaven. They carry out God's orders as it pertains to his temple, to his throne, to his altars, and so on. That order is called the order of Melchizedek. Now, the question is, was Melchizedek, was he or is he, is he a high-ranking angel, and this order, and all of these angels are in an order named after him like the order of Aaron. Aaron was a high priest, and all those who descended from Aaron 
were high priests after the order of Aaron, the, what they call the Aaronic priesthood, okay? So then we have Melchizedek. And all of the angels who serve the temple of God are in the order of Melchizedek. So the question is, is Melchizedek simply an angel or is he the Lord Jesus? So I'm going to go around and I'm going to ask you, what do you think? And I'm going to pick on Jeremy first because he came to me and said, here's what I think. So let me have it. You believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Heretic! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Even if I disagree with you, I don't think it's a big deal. Who says it was an angel? Jared says an angel. Why do you say, Jared? Should I throw the microphone back there or just... Okay. So my thought process there is, he's speaking right there, that Melchizedek was an angel, Jesus was brought for a better testament, something to, that was better than Melchizedek. Okay, I get that, I get that. And, and when, you, when you're reading Hebrews, you're always looking at type and shadow, and then the better thing. You have the animal sacrifices, and then you have the better sacrifice, which was Jesus. You have the blood, and then you have the better blood, which is Jesus. You have the, the priest, but you have a more sure priest, a better priest. You have Jesus. So you see that always in Hebrews. And so here's what you're saying, and here's my thing. If you look up here on verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but... And then here it is, made like unto the Son of God. Now, here's what I'm thinking, is that the writer is saying that Melchizedek was made like unto Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the same way, when we were talking about, you know what, I can find this. Remember when we were talking about the prophet? Look at um, Deuteronomy here. It's almost the same language. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, like unto me. In other words, Moses was a prophet for his people, but we know the real prophet, Moses, was like unto Jesus. There were similitudes. So in in my thinking here, and again, I, I, I'm scratching my head like everybody else going, Melchizedek was a foreshadowing of Christ and he was made like unto the Son of God. Does that make sense? Okay? So when I look at that, it, it, I'm, like, I'm like a lot of you guys. I look at it this way and I'm going, it looks like Jesus. And then I'm going, no, it looks like an angel. It looks like Jesus. It looks like an angel. It looks like Jesus. So, when I get to heaven before all you guys, or when you get to heaven, ask. It won't be the first question I'm going to ask, but it's got a list, okay? Uh, turn to um, Hebrews chapter 7. And I know it's a little bit after 8, but give me a minute, Okay? Why, did, why does any of this matter? It, I, I'm going I'm to say, let's say that Melchizedek is Christ. Okay, let's, just to make this part of it simple. Okay, which is really cool. I mean, you have Jesus popping up all over the New Testament. And the Jews looking right at him. All the way up into the cross, they have no idea who this is. You think about that. And you and I have never seen him. And we know exactly who he is. And the moment that he appears, we're going to know who he is. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. We've never seen him. Israel, 
They've been seeing him pop in and out of their history all their life. And they never knew who it was. God kept it from them deliberately. But to us dirty, rotten, filthy hillbillies, Gentiles, we know exactly who he is. We know he's not a statue in a church somewhere. Amen. And not going to look like that either. Amen. But when we know him, when we see him, we're going to know him. For we shall see him as he is. But here's, here's the part that I like about all this. Jesus is the high priest. So number one, if, Mel, if Abram felt that Melchizedek was worthy of 10% of every sheep, goat, and bag of barley that he had. Is not Jesus more worthy of only one-tenth of everything that you have? Now, I'm not preaching commandments. I'm not saying if you don't tithe, you're obviously not saved. What I'm telling you is, here's Abraham. He looks one time at Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and he gives him one-tenth of every grain and cow and goat and chicken that he has. The Bible says he paid him tithe of all. And when you behold Jesus in your mind, in your heart, and think about who he is to you, why is he not worth at least one-tenth? Bare minimum, one-tenth of your paycheck after taxes. Some pay tithes before taxes. And I never get into that. That's between you and God. Why is he not worth one-tenth of your weekly paycheck? Why is he not that? Okay? That's just, that's, that's between you and the Lord. Okay? But, he's far worth more than that to me. Okay? And so, verse 8, Hebrews 7. I'm going to make you turn there because you can't read it off screen. Here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. How in the world did that happen? And I, I've used this now to say, according to the Bible, you and I were in the Garden of Eden with Adam and with Eve. And when Adam sinned, it was laid upon every one of us because at that time we were in the same way Levi was in the loins of Abraham when he paid tithes. That's how this Bible's saying it. Look at here. He said, For he was yet, verse 10, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now think about that. And he's like three, three generations and like 20 years removed here at least. So Abraham's got to have Isaac. Isaac's got to have Jacob. Jacob's got to have Levi. And yet the Bible reckons Levi as already being in Abram. When Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek. So, and what the point that he's making here is, here Levi, the law designated that the tithe went to the tribe of Levi. That was their pay. That was for them not being allowed to have land and be shepherds and be you know, vine dressers and things like that. Their, their job was to give attendance to the ministry. And so the tribes gave tithes and it was distributed among the Levite priests. And so here's Levi receiving tithes and yet Levi paid tithes when he was in Abram. So what does that mean? It means, obviously, the one that Levi paid tithes to was far greater than Levi himself. Amen? Amen. Okay, now you're only going to hear me say this one time. 
okay? Because I, I mean, I, when it comes to tithing, I just, there are just things I just don't beat people, and I don't brag, but Lisa and I pay tithe. Well, why do I pay tithes if I receive a portion of them? Because the one I pay my tithes to is far greater than I who receive a portion of them. And it wouldn't be right for me to take them and not give them. Amen? Amen. It's because I know who's greater than me. Okay? And again, I, I don't talk about that, but that's just, that's where my heart is. So, he's making the point here, verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, what is he getting at? Because in, um, there was a prophecy after uh, Genesis 14, where is it in my Bible? Where is it? I made a note here and I can't find it. It's in Psalm 110. Turn there. Psalm 110. Turn there very quickly. I know people just dying to stay here longer and study this old book. And, but I just want to get you home, get you cleaned up in time for MacGyver, all right? Psalm 110. Um... We could read on down to verse 4. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Look at that. The Lord said unto my Lord. Jehovah's Witness don't like that verse. Because it makes Jesus the Lord. Okay? The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord is sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through uh, kings in the day of his wrath. And so right here in Psalm 110 4, there is a prophecy of a priest who is coming, who is after the order of Melchizedek. So the point that, that Paul is making here Back in Hebrews 7, now it's so small I can't even hardly read it. The point that he's making is, he said, What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek if, if the Levite priesthood was the perfect priesthood to absolve man's guilt and man's sins? Why then was there a prophecy in the days of David that another priest would rise, not after Aaron, not after Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek. Why then a prophecy of another priest rising up who did not come from Aaron? If the Levitical priesthood was going to be the justifier of all man's sins and with that animal blood smear away all of mankind's transgressions, why was there a need for another priest? And I'll give you this and I'm going to dismiss you. There's need for another priest because you had need of another law, another covenant, a better covenant. If you want to think that keeping the law and going back to Mount Sinai is where your real salvation is, you Hebrew roots people, okay? I'm hoping someone takes a clip of this and puts it somewhere where these Hebrew roots people are on Facebook. If you want to say that going back to Mount Sinai is where all your goody salvation is, then why wasn't Jesus a Levite? If he was a priest, why was he not from the tribe of Levi? Why did he come from Judah? Because he was priest of a better order, of better sacrifice, of a better promise, and of a better testament with better blood that covers sins longer than one year at a time. It covers them continually forever and ever and ever and ever. That's why. That's the priesthood and the priest and the covenant that I'm under. 
not the one that vanished away. Amen? He's the high priest over it all. Let's stand to our feet. So, Linda, my Sunday school teacher, was he Jesus or was he an angel? What do you think? You think he was an angel? Wow, Linda's on my side. Ah. And I'm not sure that I'm on my side half the time. Good study in the law, in the law, Lord, the word. All three of those words coming out at once. Okay, this, will, this is knowledge that's going to give you understanding. Because some churches never even touch these things. And they're important. Okay, do we know why today? No, but they're important. Father in heaven, thank you for this word. Lord, you want your people full of knowledge. You don't want them ignorant. It's the lack of knowledge that destroys people. And sometimes, Lord, we're like we were in our youth. We don't understand why we have to study certain things and why do we have to know this. But, Lord, it's in your word. So I know that you believe and know that it's important. Just because we can't see it yet doesn't take away from its importance. So, Father, we pray, God, that with this knowledge that we have gained tonight, that in due season, Lord, you would add to that understanding. And, Lord, maybe something that I'm teaching tonight to some of these young people, to some of these folks online, Maybe they're going to be in a bad way one day and they're going to be reading the Bible. And you're going to give them something that they're going to be able to tie into something they heard this very night. And you're going to show them the greatest wisdom that they've ever heard in their life. And they're going to rejoice and they're going to thank you and praise you for your word. So Father, instill in us more of this book and more of its knowledge. Increase us in knowledge, because increasing in knowledge, Lord, we increase our faith and our trust in you. Thank you for this book. We love you in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight.